So just to kick things off, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Thanks. Um, so you're here for the Doc Store Fundamentals Workshop. Uh, this is an introduction to Docker and descriptors, basically the building blocks for getting content onto your Doc Store. Um, I'll be bookending this session, and Louise and Andrew will be doing much of the heavy lifting, introducing Docker and workflow languages as they're used in Parkformatics. Um, for the learning objectives, I just want to focus on basically our overall goal. Um, this session is to provide you a good foundation on the basic tools required to develop workflows for a doc store. Um, we will be providing a variety of take-home materials to guide you on where to go next if you encounter difficulties during a session or if you just want to learn more. Um, and yes, we will be learning about what is doc store, how to use Docker, what are workflow descriptor languages with a in-depth example through Whittle to demonstrate the concepts behind uh, workflow languages. And we'll be briefly touching on some features in DocStore which will help you achieve your goals. Um, for the format and setup, I'll be going through Zoom in order to lecture, um, as well as Andrew and Louise. And DocStore Fundamentals on Discord is a great place for questions. Um, during exercises, uh, you should click on this little green button to say yes if you're done with an exercise or if we have questions during the slides. Um, our TAs for the session will be uh, Charles Overbeck, um, Natalie Perez, um, Luis Cavanzi, and Andrew Duncan. Um, so feel free to ask them questions and yeah. yeah. Um, for the format and setup, you should have had gotten a link to activate a tutorial environment called Instruct. This is a browser-based environment where you can play around with uh, the doc store command line and running workflows. Um, currently, there's a bit of a bug on Instruct with Firefox. So if you encounter problems, then try Chrome. Uh, OK, and a brief whirlwind introduction to doc store. So the idea behind doc store is basically an app store for bioinformatics. What we try to do is we try to make uh, we try to make tools for the sciences more portable, more interoperable, and more reproducible. We tackle portability by focusing on a subset of workflows, which are packaged in containers and described using descriptor languages. The idea is that you should be able to move your analysis from environment to environment. And as long as you can run something like Docker or Docker itself, then you should be able to run workflows on DocStore. What's on DocStore? So our unit of distribution um, is either a tool or a workflow. A tool is a single container that performs a single action or step. Um, a workflow is a chain of tools uh, that are strung together in order, to in order to accomplish a more complex task. As a real world example, if you're familiar with BWAMM, that would be an example of something that can fit within a uh, doc store tool and an example of something more complex that can be considered to be a workflow would be something like a variant calling pipeline. Note that in some languages you can register a single tool as a workflow, um, but we won't, uh, you're not allowed to basically register a multi step workflow as a tool. So depending on how you write your descriptor for BWMM, you could technically register it as both. Um, interoperability. So Docster relies on getting your content from a variety of places. You can upload your content to Bitbucket, GitHub, or GitLab, and then we will be able to crawl that, crawl your workflows and register them on Docster. Once they're in Docster, since we implement a number of GA4, GH standards, we are able to integrate with a variety of analysis environments in order to run your workflows. Currently, we have over 700 tools and workflows available on DocStore itself. Um, so I'm going through this really briefly. Um, and you'll go through this tutorial. And there's a lot of terms that I'm throwing at you. You will learn more about what Docker and workflow languages actually mean. But to sort of give you somewhere to shoot for or something to look forward to, after going through this tutorial, you will uh, be able to make reproducible workflows. And there's a lot of DocStore features around increasing the reproducibility of your workflows. So 
features like the ability to version and snapshot your workflows, to generate DOIs and distribute them through Zenodo, and the ability to create organizations and collections for sharing and finding workflows. But first, you'll need to know the basics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head it over to Andrew Duncan, who will be presenting on uh, the basics of DocStore, starting with how to use Docker itself. All right, can everyone uh, see my screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll be giving an introduction to, or to Docker, um, and I'll be connecting it back to DocStore a lot, because obviously that's the, the point of this lecture. Um, uh, but first, I'll give some background on what Docker is. Um, however, before we can learn about Docker, we need to understand the concept of a container. Um, so a container encapsulates all the software dependencies associated with running a program. Uh, it allows for portable software that runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. Um, we can see in this image, there's the three, three different containers above the whale. Uh, and if you look at the first one, uh, there's GATK, Java, and R installed. So a user who's running this container would not need to worry about installing these uh, software packages themselves and this would save them a lot of hassle. Um, so where does Docker fit into all this? Uh, Docker is actually a popular uh, brand of container. Um, you may have heard of some other ones, such as Singularity, but that's, that's beyond the scope of this uh, tutorial, though we will link to some documentation on it uh, at the end of this uh, in our, in our take-home workshop. Okay, so Docker and containers in general, they help us solve a lot of problems. Uh, first, there's installation problems. Uh, these problems are related to installing the software that we want to run. So perhaps the software is built on a different OS, or maybe there's install documentation, uh, but it's unclear, or maybe it's out of date. So that kind of makes it hard to, to do an install, uh, whereas the Docker image would have this software bundled up already. So the user wouldn't need to worry about any of this installation, and you wouldn't run into these issues. Um, next, there are dependency problems. Um, these problems are related to the dependencies required to get the software working. Um, so for example, software may require a different version of Java or Python than what is available on the machine. Or, or perhaps you have multiple programs um, you run on your computer and each rely on the same dependency, but they rely on different versions of those dependencies, so maybe different versions of Python. Um, using containers resolves this dependency because you can isolate these environments and have it self-contained. Um, Finally, there's these portability problems that it solves. Uh, things might work on one system, however, not on one used by one of your collaborators, which I'm sure a lot of you have faced before. Uh, instead of having to support multiple systems, you could simply use a container. Uh, for Docker's case, a Docker container will run on any host that supports Docker or has Docker installed. Um, okay, so now that we understand uh, what containers are, and what Docker is and what problems they solve. We're going to focus on some Docker concepts. Um, so in Docker speak, a container is a running image. It is packaged up, isolated software environments. It has all its dependencies installed. Um, whereas an image is packaged up code with all of its dependencies, but at rest. And that's the key difference. Um, the terms container and image are often used interchangeably. And as I've said, this isn't exactly true. Um, images allow for portable software that runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to the next. Um, and there's also official Docker images um, from Docker Hub. These images are regularly updated and scanned for vulnerabilities. Um, and finally, there's the concept of registry. So you may have heard of some of these registries listed here. Um, and a registry is simply a repository where users can store images. And this could be private or publicly. And it's done on the cloud. Um, one common confusion is, does DocStore store images or host images? We don't. Um, but rather, we get these images from these image repositories. And again, here are some of the main ones. 
uh, the doc store support. So there's Docker Hub, which is the official one, there's KIO, and there's Google Container Registry. Um, so this slide is showing a high level overview of the Docker e ecosystem. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see there's image registry. So this is the one that I was just talking about. And this is where these Docker images are stored and where they're shared from. Uh, on the right, there's the host machine. Um, and this is one thing you can see is the Docker daemon. So this is a service that's running uh, on your host machine and does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, the Docker CLI, which is also on the host machine, is a command line tool for interacting with this Docker daemon. There are a few commands that we show here in this diagram, and I'll go into them in a bit. Um, there's also, as you can see, the images and containers, which are stored on the local, uh, on the host machine. Um, and these images could come from an image registry, or they could be locally built. And we'll go more into that in a bit as well. So this slide is going through that first command, which is the Docker pull, and just looking at it from a high level perspective. Um, so Docker pull will first pull, so pretty much you give Docker pull a image that you're interested in, and that image is located on the image registry. That will be pulled and downloaded onto the host machine, and now you have that image stored on your machine. Um, this slide is showing how the Docker run command works. Um, so it's, it's what you actually will be running for uh, when you actually want to run these containers. And what it does is it'll take an image that you have and it'll instantiate it and create a running container. Um, one thing to note is the Docker run will actually perform um, a pull if the image doesn't already exist on the machine. So if this is your first time running an image or perhaps it's updated, um, it'll actually pull from the, the image registry where it's supposed to come from. All right, so I'm just going to talk a bit about Instruct. So you should have gotten an email invitation to Instruct, and possibly you set up an account before this training session. Um, if you didn't get an email, I, I think we're sharing in the Zoom chat, or maybe in Discord, um, a link uh, to Instruct. And an account is not actually required to run this tutorial, so you can do it anonymously. Um, the link should go to a page which says like start the BCC 2020 track. When you click on that, you'll get to another page which will have this section here. Um, and if you click on the start button, it'll start preparing uh, the environments. And this takes about a minute or two, but once the environment's done, uh, done being built, there'll be a start button and that'll actually get you into this machine. Um, so while that's going on, I'm going to give an overview of the Docker CLI. Um, but first, I'll do this myself so that everyone can see an example of this at work. So I won't be going from the email, but the email should take you to this page um, for the BCC 2020 uh, training track. Uh, currently, it's maintenance. Let me just refresh it. Yeah, so you should see Doc Store Sandbox and the Start button. And now I'm going to click on this, and it says welcome, and it's creating the environment. So it takes about a minute or two. Uh, once it's done creating, uh, there'll be a start button here, and we'll go into it. But while that's happening, I'm just going to go through uh, some. I'm going to go through the Doc Store CLI, or Docker CLI. Okay, so the Doc Store clients is a command line utility, and it's used for a lot of things. Uh, this includes downloading and building Docker images. Uh, running Docker containers, and also managing images and containers um, in the context of like cleaning up your, your disk space, because these, these images actually get quite large. And you'll see that as you're building them. Uh, and it, it does more than that as well. Uh, this code block here is just showing the general format of the Docker CLI command. So you have the, obviously you're invoking the Docker uh, program. And then there's going to be subcommands. So that could be something like run or images or containers, uh, but I will walk through this in a second. OK, um, so here's some of the subcommands I was mentioning before. Uh, these aren't all of them, but this is like some of the more, some of the more common ones you'll be seeing, especially during this lecture. Um, the Docker info command up here, this displays system-wide information uh, about your Docker installation. 
so currently if you were to run this, there, it just prints out a lot of stats and you wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't make sense to you, but we're hoping at the end of this tutorial, at least some of it will make sense. Um, there's also the Docker image subcommand, and this is used for image related commands. And there's also the Docker container command, and that's used for container uh, related commands. And finally, one of the main commands you'll use is this Docker run command. And this is used to actually run the Docker containers. And you can see this is the general structure, um, but I'll go into it more in the next slide. Um, and we will have you running an example container actually in the instruct environment quite soon. Uh, so how are containers commonly used? Uh, one way is this concept of run and done. So you have a Docker run command that you execute. This starts the container. Something happens in the container, so an action is performed. And then the container will stop running once this action is complete. Um, another way is that they run continuously. So you execute the Docker run command, the container will start, and it will run in the background continuously. Um, other processes can interact with this container and perform some actions. Um, and the container, one thing to note is the container will keep running unless it is stopped. Um, so for doc store and likely for you as bioinformaticians um, or software developers, you will be creating uh, the run and done type. So this is your typical workflows where you start off with some input, you perform some, a few actions, and then you end up with some output. Okay, so now I'll finally go into the meat of the uh, Docker run command. So the first part you'll see is this base command here. So Docker run. Uh, the next part is this optional flag. So there's a lot of optional flags, but you don't really need any to run some of the more basic images. Um, but one example you could do is you could use the name uh, flag to specify a name for the container just to make it easier to reference instead of using an ID. Um, the next thing is the registry name. Uh, this registry name, um, you can think of like a namespace. So if it's from Docker Hub or from PIO or from Google Cloud or from the Google Container Registry, uh, it'll be here. But one thing to note is it assumes if you don't specify this, that it is from Docker Hub. So if you don't see PIO or anything like that, it's, from, it's a Docker Hub image that you're referencing. Um, and then, of course, you need the path to the image. So this could be something like Ubuntu or SAM tools, which we'll look at soon. Um, and this works for both the official containers, which are blessed by Docker Hub or Docker, and uh, any user containers that are available. Um, and then another thing to add, which is optional, is the version of the image you want to run. So obviously, if you're trying to do reproducible analysis, you'd want to run the same using the same version of a software. So you can use this tag to ensure that you're using the same version as previous times. And then finally, there's the arguments. And this is what's actually passed to the container. So this is the command you actually want to run. And it'll be run within the container. Um, so as previously mentioned, we'll be using the platform called Instruct to complete the exercises. And just a quick summary of what it is. It's a browser-based tutorial environment. And we've set up an environment that has things like Docker and the Doc Store CLI installed so that you guys, you all don't have to do it. Um, this will save you all the hassle for the installs. Um, you can kind of think of it like Code Academy if you've used that before. Um, I'll quickly give a demo of the environment because it should be ready by now. Yeah, so there's this green start button here. So if you click on the start button, we'll go into it. So here's the sandbox. Uh, this part isn't too relevant, so just a quick intro, so we can hide that. Um, but as you can see, there's these different tabs. So we're going to go into the terminal tab. And I'm just going to show you that Docker is, in fact, installed. So first, I'll run this docker info command. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of specs that are printed out. So is it in debug mode? How many containers do we have? How many are stopped? Number of images. Um, but it also has a whole bunch of other things. So it can be quite useful. Um, but I'll show you the docker help command, because this will print out all the different subcommands that you have available. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a lot. Um, but yeah, so this is just confirming that we do have Docker installed. And one other thing I want to note, so we have two sections of 
exercises. One is for Docker and one is for Whittle. So for the first part that I'm going through, you'll want to look at this Docker instructions here. Um, we'll also have these in the slides, but this is just another place where you can see um, where the exercises that we're doing are. And don't click outside. This is just our documentation. You'll only be using this one page. Okay. So we're going to get right into our first exercise. Um, this will have you running something called Whale Say, which is it's a Hello World type program with a bit of a twist. Um, you may have heard of Cow Say before, and it's similar to that. Um, so the command is given both here on this lecture slide, as you can see here, um, but is also in that instruction file, which I just mentioned earlier. Um, so try running this command and replacing this fill me in section with your own text. Um, if you run into any issues, please raise your hands um, or please make a comment on the Discord uh, channel and we'll have someone get back to you. Um, so we'll just give you a few minutes to complete this now. And remember, when you've completed the exercise, please uh, go to the participants and click yes so that we know it when everyone's done. So I'm seeing a lot of green check marks. That's a good sign. And again, if you have any issues, um, just raise your hands or make a comment or make or message the chat in the uh, Discord. So there's a question, is there a way to see the, both the terminal and the instructions tab at the same time in instruct? And I don't know. Let me see. Um, actually, I'll send a link actually that will help one sec. I can send out the link. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for context, the uh, the instructions that are here are hosted on our docs. So you can also Louise will send out a link to the docs, and you can just do your screen half and half with that. Okay. 
Okay, so it's been about three minutes, but I still don't see all greens, but for the sake of time, we'll keep going. And again, if you have any questions later on, ask on Discord. And we'll also, when we take a break, you can ask more questions with the, um, with the TAs. Okay, so what you should have seen was a whale um, and it's printing out whatever message you typed in. And there's an example of this in that uh, in the Docker instructions here. So I just put hello. So you'll see it saying hello, but you can put hello, whatever your name is, and I'll say hello. Okay, so oops. So now we're going to look at how do you explore containers interactively. So previously, the count or the whale say commands, it was the run and done type. Um, which is usually the case, but sometimes you might want to enter the container while it's running. Just to, maybe you're developing the, the con or the image, or you just want to test things out. Um, so previously, actually at the top right here, there's these flags um, that you can have for the Docker run command, and they're optional. Um, here, there's these two, the I and the T flag, and these you can think of they drop you inside the container. Um, the dash I will keep the standard in open for interactive use, and the T allocates a terminal. Uh, you can then interact with the container's terminal uh, as if you're interacting with a normal command line. Um, so down here, we have an example. Um, and here, we're showing, we're running the SAM tools container, and we're going to run an interactive mode. So this is just a container that we made, or that Louise made, that has a SAM tools installed. And this will enter interactively so that you can interact with it. And we'll see this in action in a few minutes. Um, the next concept I want to go into is how do we share data between the host and the container? Um, so it's a common need that we'll want to share this data. Um, in the previous slide, I showed running SAM tools in a container, but this isn't really much use unless you actually have data to call SAM tools on. So if SAM tools can't access that data, it's, it's pretty much useless. Um, so that's where the dash V command comes in. And this is known as a bind mount. It'll take some host directory, and it'll map it to a directory within a container. Um, any files that are added to either directory are available in the other. Um, so the first code block shows the format of this command. Um, sometimes the orders, people mix it up. But pretty much the first one is the path on the host. So this may be where your data currently is, and then separated by colon, and then the path on the container. So this um, data that's put into this uh, host folder here will be accessible in the container at this folder. Uh, and not only is this flag useful for getting the data into the container, it's also useful for retrieving the data that's generated by the container. So any data created in the container that is not stored in one of these uh, shared directories is actually lost when the container is exited or when it finishes running. Uh, so it's important that we store any of this output into a shared directory such as this. Um, in the example at the bottom, we have this slash user slash data on the host machine, and that's mapped on the container for slash temp slash data. Um, any files that we write in the container to slash temp slash data once the container's done running, or actually even once still running, if we go on our host machine to slash user slash data, we will see that data. Um, one thing to note, though, is we highly recommend using absolute paths when you're doing this uh, bind mounting with a dash v command. All right, so now we're going to move on to our next hands-on exercise. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to give a quick demo um, for something I had shown earlier, which was the uh, SAM tools. And I'm just going to show um, how this interactive, uh, the IT flag works. So if I go here, it's going to clear. And then I'm going to run dash IT, PIO, and the SAM tools latest. So I'm going to run it. Can't find it locally, so now it's going to pull it. It's pulled it. And if you noticed, this previously was root Ubuntu 18.04, and now it's Ubuntu, or root at uh, just this long string. 
So this is saying I'm inside the container. So I'm no longer in my host machine. I'm now within the container. And I'll just confirm that SAM tools is installed. So uh, if you type in SAM tools, it just prints out the help message. Um, so yeah, so we have it installed, but again, it's not very useful if we don't have it, if we don't let the container access any data. So to exit out of the container, you can type in exit and then press enter or return. And as you see, I'm now back into my host. Okay. So yeah, this isn't very useful unless we actually have data that we can run SAM tools on. Um, so this exercise will have you running two commands shown here. And um, the first is actually going to get you to enter the SAM tools container and just confirm that this uh, directory here, which includes some data, is properly mounted to the slash data within the container. Um, and then the second command will use the SAM tools and I'll actually call a SAM tools command and it'll convert this uh, mini SAM file into a BAM file and it'll store it. And that should be accessible outside of the container. So from your host machine. Um, the exercise is again also on that instructions file. And also Louise sent, probably sent a link to it as well if you want to open it uh, side by side. Um, again, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Press yes once, or press the yes option once you're finished with the exercise. And also use Discord or the chat here if you have any questions. Um, we'll give you a bit more time to complete this exercise because it is more complex. Plus, it'll give you some time to uh, explore the containers. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a heads, all a heads up when there's only a few minutes left. Oops. Oh, one thing, don't delete any of the data within this data folder as it, it, it might be used in a later exercise. So just to save you from having to restart your environment. So again, if you go to the Docker instructions, um, it'll have the different uh, exercises, but there's also this extra reading at the bottom. And if, you're, if you need to go back to figure out what the dash IT are for, or maybe what the dash V does, you can see that down here uh, for an example. And again, remember, it's the path where the data is on the host directory mapped to where it is on the container. So the first path is going to be on your instruct machine. And the second path will be somewhere within your container. Oops. So let's just check. I see some greens. Okay. 
And I, I see a question, will the new mini BAM file be saved locally at the uh, slash root slash BCC training slash data? And yes, it will, will be. Anything in the shared, uh, in these connected uh, folders, if you write to one, it'll be available in the other. So there's a question about how can we get the data out later. Um, if you run this command right here, for example, so if you notice the command that's being run, slash data mini.sam, it outputs to slash data mini.bam. Those are paths within the container based on this uh, mapping here. Um, but once you run this and it finishes, it'll store the output the output will be stored and accessible in this root slash BCC 2020 training slash data. Oops. And I'll just give a few more minutes. Seems like most people have it. So someone is saying, why is the slash data folder not show up, not showing up in the SAM tools container? Um, so it should show up because the, the dash V command will, oops, it'll create the folder on the container if it doesn't already exist. Uh, so it should create the slash data. So if you do ls slash data while you're within the container, it should work. I'm just going to give one more minute for the sake of time. Um, but again, we'll have a break for about 10 minutes where you're free to ask these questions to all the TAs. So there is one question about the difference between dash V and dash mounts. So I'll move on really quick, but um, we'll have some readings about this, but the gist is dash mount is just a more verbose way to do the same thing. Okay, so hopefully you're able to finish the exercise. Um, again, if you have any issues, please message on Discord. We do have an upcoming break if you don't, or if, if you have questions. Okay, so for the, there is like, we only covered the very basics of data binding, the most basic examples. There are some useful tips and there's also some caveats, which we don't go into here just due to the time. Um, and you'll probably wanna read this if you're interested in like learning about the dash dash mounts and some other questions. Um, we will have a post workshop training material. Um, it'll just be a Google doc or something with a whole bunch of useful links related to the, to all this. Okay, um, so sometimes you'll 
find that there's no existing image for the software that you want to use. Or maybe there's an existing image, but it lacks something. Maybe it needs to be updated to a newer version of the software. Or maybe a newer version of that software has caused something to change, so it no longer works. So that's where Docker files come in. So Docker files are used to create our own custom images. So all the Docker images are based on Docker files. Um, and these all start from a base image. And then it contains a series of steps. And these steps are what set up the environments. And we will, or I will go into this a bit more detail soon. Um, and one cool thing is we can then share these custom images via an image registry so that other people can use them and contribute to them. Um, OK, so before we talk more about Docker files, I thought it'd be good to think conceptually how we usually install software and how it's usually used, um, just because it's important for when we're working with Docker files. So there's a few ways where there's a few ways that we can actually install software and use it. One is package managers, and these manages the collection of software, and they have things like automated install. They have upgrades, and they can remove uh, software very easily. Uh, then there's the executable files and binaries. And these are software that's already been built or compiled into executable files. So these probably look familiar, like a .jar file or a .c file. There's also like the built-in uh, commands such as grep or tar or diff, md5 sum. These are all executable files or binaries. And then finally, there's building or running source files. So this is more labor intensive, but you might have to actually compile from a source build yourself and then build it into an executable or something along those lines. So you as a Docker, as a Docker file author, you'll outline these steps once, and then your downstream users will never have to worry about that again. So they'll never have to worry about using these package managers, using these executable files, or like building stuff from source files, and going through complex markdown files. They just run a Docker file and it's easy for them. So it's off the shelf. So I'm going to look at now the uh, kind of general overview of what a Docker file looks like. Um, it's really just a simple text file with instructions to build an image. It is YAML syntax. So if you look at the top, it starts from a base image. And you'll always see that. There's metadata. That's another core component. So in this case, we have maintainer, such as like the authorship information, which is pretty important. Um, then there's sections for installing the software and any dependencies required. And that's the run section. And this can also be set, calling setup scripts as well. Um, you can do other environmental prep. So you can use this like env command to set environment variables. And then finally, you can define, this is optional, but you can define the commands that are run when the container starts. So how does the Docker file fit in to the whole ecosystem of Docker? Of Docker? Um, well, the Docker file comes before the, the image, and it must be built in order to create a Docker image that can be, then be shared and used by everyone. So in this case, instead of um, pulling something from a Docker registry, you'd be building it locally from a Docker file, and that would create the image. Um, you can then, now that you've created this image based on a Docker file, you can now run it the exact same way you did before and create a container. So this is a simple example that we're going to look at. It's BWA. It's an alignment uh, algorithm. And this is installed via package manager, which is one of the examples of how uh, you might be installing your software currently. Um, it's installed with APT. Uh, now, this has the same components that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, you'll notice if you think of it in terms of components, no matter how big these get, um, as long as you think about them in terms of components, they get easy to follow. Um, so you start with a base image, um, and that's true for all Docker files, and you can add metadata. So in this case, you're adding some uh, authorship. This is optional, but highly recommended. Um, then you can do things like uh, 
install any dependencies that you need or change the user, which we won't go into here. And then you can install the actual analysis software that you want to use. And in this case, we're just installing PWA with APT. So earlier, I mentioned that we need to build Docker files uh, to create the Docker images. And that's what this Docker build command. Uh, you can see at the top the general structure. Um, it also has the flag options, but it has something called the build context, which can be a bit confusing. Um, think of it like it's a directory containing a set of files the build process can refer to during the build. Uh, so this includes like the Docker file. Um, and by default, the docstore CLI will look for a Docker file in the root of the build context. Um, so like you give a path and then it looks for it's that path slash Docker file. Uh, typically people use the current directory as the build context, which is why you'll see this period uh, for most Docker builds here and probably elsewhere. And that just sets the current directory to be the build context. And then typically your Docker file would be in that same directory. Um, there are two important flags that we're gonna look at. There's this dash T flag and this dash F flag. So the dash T flag is used to name images and to create tags. So in this first example here, you can see we're building a Docker image in the current, with the build context that is current directory. So we're just implicitly using the Docker file in the current directory. We're gonna name that contain, or we're gonna name that image BWA and the version or the tag is gonna be V1.0. And then there's another uh, useful flag, and this is to override the default path of the Docker file, which again, I said before, it looks just relative to the build context and build and path that you give slash Docker file. Um, in this case, we're overriding that. And we're saying it's in this folder Docker file slash BWA slash Docker file. Um, but you'll end up with the exact same image, assuming that the Docker files, the references are the same file. And then you can also um, view the Docker images that you've built using this Docker image ls command. Um, and that, that's useful for seeing what you've built and what versions of different, uh, of different images you have. Okay, so before we get to the next exercise, I'm gonna go over some more instruct stuff. So you might have seen that there's the editor on the top left, but I haven't actually gone into it yet. Um, so here you can see, it's like your typical VS code or any of the um, development environments. You can see these different things. So currently we're in the Docker training section here. Um, and there's some example Docker files here, such as BAM stats, BWA and SAM tools. But for the next exercise, we'll be using uh, this Docker file here. And it's, we have this Docker file for the BWA as a reference because they are quite similar. And we also have the solution here. So try not to look at the solution before you figure this out. But again, if you look here, I can, double, I can click on this and it opens here. Um, and as you can see, there's this, uh, typical Docker image that I just showed. However, it's missing some stuff. So it's missing the base image and whatnot. Um, so you'll be, in this exercise, you'll be going through this and fixing it. Uh, one thing to note is, if you make a change, it doesn't automatically save. You have to click this save icon up here. So make sure you do that or else you'll get errors when it tries to build it, but it'll say this is invalid. So make sure to save it. And again, here in this BWA example, you can open that and this is the working BWA workflow, or sorry, working BWA Docker file. Okay. Um, so this is just an overview of the next exercise. You'll be writing your first Docker file, and this is using the Tabix software, uh, which is used to index genome position files. So you're gonna use that skeleton Docker file I showed, uh, which is also shown here, and you're gonna update it to get it working. And you can use the BWA Docker file that I showed as well in the editor as a base. Um, but the gist of what you'll want to do is you're going to try updating the base image to Ubuntu 18.04. You're going to install any extra dependencies. In this case, there's no extra dependencies. 
and then you're finally going to install the analysis software. So this is also using APT and the software is called Tabix. So once you have that done, don't forget to save it up here. And then you'll want to build the image from the Docker file using the uh, commands that I just went through. So again, you can ask um, questions in the chat here or in Discord. Uh, press the yes option once you've completed. Um, I'll give you a bit more time to do this exercise because it's a bit more uh, in hands on. Um, but I'll give a warning again when we're a few minutes from finishing the exercise. So I'll keep this slide up, but again, it's also visible if you go to the doc store. If you go to the instruct page, go to the Docker instructions, um, and then you go down to the, the exercise two, and it'll talk about it here. And it also gives you like the build command. But I'll leave this open here. So once you finish with the Docker file and you save it, um, don't forget to build it using the build commands. So there's an example at the bottom of this slide. Um, and remember the dash F is optional. If you're in the same directory as the Docker file, it's not required. So one option is to change directories into the, uh, the folder that contains that Docker file. And just a reminder, um, the yes icon, you open the participants list and it's just right here.
So someone's getting an error that they can't install Tabix. Um, hmm. It should be available via APT. Yeah, make sure your base image is set to 1804, Ubuntu 1804. Okay, so we're at 22 yeses, so we'll just give a few more minutes. Oh, yeah, sorry. So to change directories, um, if you haven't done that before, it's CD and then the path to the directory you're changing to. But it's actually not required for this if you just give the full path in the dash F option. Okay, CD does not work. So because of time constraints, I'm just going to give two more minutes. Um, but if, if anyone's having trouble with the CD, there is a link, or sorry, there is the command in the chat from Charles Overbeck that should put you into the correct directory. Okay, yeah, only edit anything that's in these curly braces uh, for this tutorial. Sorry, I should have emphasized that. Um, everything else, just leave it as is. So I'm just going to give one more minute, but I, I will go over the solution. So yeah, you're going to have to keep the user root and also the um, apt update commands. I think the apt update command will update the list of dependencies that uh, the container knows about. And then that's why I can't find Tabix, because it doesn't have the updated list of dependencies. OK, so we're at 30. I'm just going to walk through the solution. Um, and again, if you are having issues, you can ask during the, uh, during the upcoming break for help. OK, so this is the solution. Um, as you can see, it looks pretty similar to the BWA Docker file. Um, actually, the only difference is that the apt install installs Tabix instead of BWA. Um, and here is, I hope that's not blocking. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there is the- uh, It's blocking. Okay. It's gone now? Yes. 
OK, awesome. Yes, yeah, so at the bottom of the screen, there's one possible command that you could have run. This is assuming that you didn't change directories. So it's going to build, it's going to say dash t tabix, so it's going to name it tabix. It's going to set the Docker file to be that path shown there. And it's going to use the period as the build context, so the current directory. Um, but if you had changed directories, you probably wouldn't need that dash f. Um, so again, anyone who had any issues, please, during the, uh, during the upcoming break, please reach out to an instructor. Also, it wasn't necessary to name uh, it Tabix. Like, you can still build it without the dash T, but it's useful for referencing later on. OK, so now we're going to try out your new container. Um, or sorry, now we're going to try out your new image by running that local container. Um, so the first thing we'll need to do is figure out what the image ID is, and then we can use that to run the command, uh, to run the run command. Um, uh, and what this will do if you run the second command at the bottom is it should print out the help for Tabix, and that just confirms that you're in the container. You were in the container; it's installed. Um, again, the exercise information is also in that Docker training uh, tab shown up here, or Docker instructions. Um, please uh, select yes once you've completed, and ask any questions on Discord or um, or in the chat. And now, if you didn't get your uh, image built before, try just using, we do have the solution here. So you can go to this directory um, and just do the Docker build. Maybe one of the TAs can just write down the commands so that we could have that done for anyone who couldn't build. And again, I'll give a warning when we're a few minutes from finishing. Yeah, so if you look at the chat, Louise has uh, sent the instructions for building it. So if you can build it uh, previously, just follow or just run that command and it should build the solution. So I'll just show that right here. Oh no, maybe the path is wrong. Oh, I think the copy paste isn't working, darn. Okay, so that's unfortunate. It seems that the slash in the chat is seen as a different character here, so you're gonna have to type it out. So for build context, yeah, it's a bit confusing, but it's like the folder from where everything runs. So it'll look in that folder that you give as the build context for the Docker file. Um, we will link to, uh, to some advanced, or not advanced, but we will link to some like post workshop uh, tutorials, which go further into what the build context means.
So I'm actually just going to demo the Docker, the first command. So if I do Docker image ls, you can see here in the first row, I have tabix v10 um, with here's the image ID. And that's the image ID you'll be wanting to copy. Yours will be different from mine, though, or it might be different from mine. OK, so how are people doing? 21 yeses. I'll just give two more minutes. Yeah, so I didn't want to go too into the build context just because it's a bit, it can be a bit more advanced, but I think like the Docker, Docker will also copy the build context and pass it along. Um, but yeah, it, it's for simplicity, it's similar to the path. Okay, just for the sake of time. I'm just going to demo this command right here. So docker run image ID tabix. So if I do docker run this one tabix. So it's run. It's run this command here and it confirms that our docker image or docker file was successfully built to docker image and that image had tabix installed in it. So that's awesome. Okay, and if you had any troubles with that, again, please reach out to us through Discord or the chat here, or um, during the upcoming break session, ask for help. And okay, so this is a slightly more complex example. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of it. Um, but the key thing I want to state here, or sorry, first I should specify that what this is. So BAM stats is a software, and pretty much given a BAM file, it'll generate some statistics. Um, but the key takeaway I want to give here is that even though the Docker file looks more complex, it's still doing the same core steps. So it might be a bit overwhelming at first, but it'll save your users and possibly you if you're doing the building this and running this a lot, a lot of time in the future. Um, so don't focus on specifically what's being run, just the overall structure of it. So you still start from a base image up here. You still give some authorship information. Here it's just installing some dependencies. It's going to install the actual analysis software here. And then here it's just doing some setup scripts. And then here at the bottom, it's just the defaults command that's run. But again, that is optional. Okay, And then the final, um, the final Docker file I'll show is the SAM tools one. Um, and this is an example of compiling from source. Um, so um, this is when we actually have to build um, or compile the source files to make an executable. Uh, again, it, it may look a bit intimidating, but it follows the same general formula. Um, it starts with this base and then adds some metadata. And again, it's just talking about the authorship. It's going to install some dependencies. Then it's actually going to install the actual software. And then it just does some setup scripts and just also does some changes to the environments to add it to the path. Um, but again, it's a very similar structure that you'll be seeing recurring throughout Docker files when you're creating them in the future. OK, so as developers at BOSC, we're obviously very fond of source control and open source. So with Docker files, things are no different. Um, DocStore recommends that you use uh, an external Git repository, uh, such as like GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, um, to track or keep track of your Docker files history. Um, 
And then you can register these Docker files to an image registry such as Docker Hub, a GCR, or GIO. Uh, and these will actually build your uh, Docker files into Docker images and they'll be available to other people and yourself to use. Um, and some of these also have extra stuff like vulnerability scanning. I think KIO will also do some vulnerability scanning, um, which is nice. Okay, so this is some more take home reading for just best practices for when working with Docker files. I, I won't go into it here, but they'll also, again, we'll link a lot of extra tutorials in our take home guide, uh, which we will send later after the uh, conference. Um, so uh, now we're just going to go on break for, I think, about 10 minutes. So if you had any trouble completing one of the previous exercises, now's a good time to talk to one of the TAs to see if they can get it working for you. All right. OK, so let's get back into it. Um, so what's next? So Docker is great. Um, it tells us how to install software. However, it doesn't tell us how to use software. Um, and that's where descriptor languages are, are that's where descriptor languages come in. Um, there's a solution to this problem. And Louise will be going through them at, in her introduction to descriptors. Um, so I'll just switch now. All right, everyone, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right, great. So today I'm gonna giving I'm gonna give the go over the descriptor training today. So we're gonna be walking through a little in depth. Um, is, but the high level concepts that we're gonna go over are largely shared across all the descriptors that Docsor supports, like CWL, Whittle, and Nextflow. So these shared concepts make it easier to translate from one language to the next. Um, so whatever we go over with Whittle today, it'll make it easier to transfer that knowledge if you wanna write CWL or Nextflow uh, descriptors. We'll also be providing a CWL and Nextflow version of all the examples and exercises in today's workshop when we send home the take home exercises and and next steps um, in the syllabus format. Okay. So what are the common components and concepts shared by descriptors? So Andrew just went over how um, in-depthly about containers. So a container is a package of code with all its dependencies. Inside the container is everything the software needs to run which allows this software to become portable and runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. A descriptor is the workflow language used to describe how to run your software, how to run your analysis pipeline. In your descriptor, you're going to say which containers you're going to need to run your pipeline, what steps to run and when to run them, you're also gonna be defining some parameter variables. And these parameters can be things like what input and output data you need, or any compute requirements that, are, that might be necessary to run um, your analysis. And the parameter file specifies the actual values that you're gonna fill into these parameters. So you can think of descriptor as the template and you can think of the parameter file as the values to map to that template. So CWL, or the Common Workflow Language, um, is one of the descriptors that DocStore supports. It's act, it was actually the first descriptor that DocStore supported. So um, CWL is an open and portable standard for describing analysis workflows and tools. It's an alternative to Whittle and Nextflow that might be used in your lab or um, institute. 
Uh, we'll also be giving you this tutor the tutorial examples, but in CWL um, for you to compare what we did today to how it would look like if you use CWL. So the implementations or engines that you need to actually run the CWL workflow, these engines are what actually understands the CWL language um, so that the machine can understand what you'd like to run. So CWL doesn't officially have a single official engine, but CWL tool is the reference implementation or engines. Other implementations include Arvados, Toil, and Cromwell also support CWL. On the DocStore platform, we have a launch with feature, which you can launch workflows into an analysis platform, which is uh, basically a, a cloud compute environment. Um, and for CWL workflows in particular, you have the choice of launching a workflow that's hosted on DocStore into the Seven Bridges Cancer Genomics Cloud. Nextflow is another descriptor supported by DocStore. Um, Nextflow is a fl fluent domain-specific language, and it's also useful for scientific use workflows that use software containers. One particular thing to note is Nextflow um, supports both Docker containers and Singularity containers natively. And you can view Nextflow as an alternative to CWL and Whittle, and Nextflow might be the more common choice that you use um, in your particular lab or institute. Uh, we'll also be providing the tutorial examples that we're going to go over today with the Nextflow equivalents. Uh, just look out for the email when we send those out uh, at the end of BOSS or BCC. Uh, for running Nextflow workflows, you can run them on your local machines, HPC environments, you can run them on AWS, Google Cloud, uh, cloud support. Uh, cloud support is available via Sequester Labs. So finally, there's the workflow description language, also known as Whittle. Uh, and the examples we're going to go over today are going to be in Whittle. Whittle is known as a human readable and writable descriptor language. The engines that understand Whittle uh, include Cromwell. So Cromwell was the first execution engine that understands Whittle. It's a workflow management system geared towards scientific workflows. Uh, both Cromwell and the workflow descriptor workflow description language, aka Whittle, were started at the Broad Institute but have since spun off into their own open source projects. Other analysis engines that other workflow engines that, that understand Whittle include Toil and Mini, Mini Whittle. So on DocStore, the analysis platforms that you can use to launch Whittle workflows that are available on DocStore include Terra, which also include the Anvil and Biodata Catalyst platforms, which uh, under the hood use the Terra platform. You can also run the Whittle workflows on DNA Stack, DNA Nexus, and you can also install Cromwell or another engine so that you can run workflows, Whittle workflows on your local machines, on HPC clusters, and maybe your own personal cloud compute instances. So Whittle has many features that you can use to do some cool analysis, but my main goal today is to go over some basic fundamentals um, and to use, so that you can use these fundamentals to understand more powerful features described in the Whittle documentation and in later tutorials. So let's go. So the three top level components that are part of the core structure of Whittle script are the workflow, the call, and the task. So first, the workflow. Uh, this is the workflow component is basically the workflow block. It's denoted by the special workflow keyword in the Whittle language. This is here where you give a name to your workflow. Um, and this is an important namespace identifier that'll be, that, that, that'll be useful to keep track of later. Um, Basically, you can think of the workflow block as an outline for your entire Whittle workflow. 
So part of your workflow clock um, has the inputs and outputs that you'd like to put into your workflow. Uh, like I said, the workflow block is an outline. So the inputs that you specify here are actually optional. Um, it's useful to specify inputs in the workflow block when you're building more complex workflows that might uh, need to reuse the same input for multiple downstream tasks or multiple purposes. Otherwise, you would probably define the inputs in the individual tasks themselves. But outputs, however, are different. Here, what you're specifying in the workflow blocks output um, output block are the work are the outputs of the entire workflow um, that you want Cromwell to keep track of later. So this is basically saying to Cromwell, I want to keep these whatever outputs are produced from this workflow, and I want you to put them in a special directory. So the, another top level component of a little workflow is the call. So a call uh, is a component that defines which tasks a workflow will run. This is still located within the workflow block, but you can specify input parameters at this point to pass to that task. Um, and specifying input parameters here at the call level is also optional. This is, you'd maybe want to specify them if, say, you're passing inputs uh, that you've defined at the workflow block, say, something that you've defined once globally and you want to pass it to a specific call, or if you want to say the output of one task as the input of another task. Otherwise, you would probably specify inputs at the task level. So the tasks are the third uh, high-level little component I want to go over today. Um, and a task is basically referred to within a call within the workflow block, but it's actually defined outside of that workflow block. So let's go over some what tasks are in depth. So a task defines all the necessary information to perform an action. The command block is that action that you want to perform in a task. So the command is actually required when you define a task block. So it just basically the command is um, you're saying this, I want this to be run in the execution environment. It's very simple to the commands you'd run on your command line. Um, you can specify multiple lines or multiple commands within your command block. So you to further specify what we can define at a task level are let's go over some inputs. So inputs to a command or inputs to a task are optional and they're only required if that task will have inputs. Um, inputs must be typed. So for example, I'm saying uh, that this input called my name is gonna be a file and I'm passing that file will be used in my command. Um, but the inputs that you specify here can also be optional. As in, the individual inputs can be optional and the entire input block can be optional in itself. So if you want to say that an individual input is optional, someone does not need to pass something, you would give it a question mark. Um, if you want to set a default value for an input, um, you can also do that as well. So if somebody does not give me um, this file, then set my name equal to foobar, for example. And so at the task level, you're also in um, defining some outputs for your task. So in the output section, you're saying these are the values that should be exposed as outputs after a successful run of this task. And outputs, just like inputs, must also be typed. File, string, integer, object, etc. So we've gone over a few basic pieces of a task. We've gone over the inputs, the command, 
and the outputs. And that is actually all you need to run a very simple task in a workflow. Let's go over a simple example, the hello world example for a very simple Whittle. So first we're gonna say what version of Whittle um, we're using. We're gonna add and name a workflow block. So I'm gonna create a workflow called hello world. I'm gonna call a task called hello. Um, and an important thing, just to make sure that the output for the whole workflow is, is captured by Cromwell, I'm gonna specify an output block and I'm gonna say that this output is gonna be a file with an identifier called hello file. And this file will come from my hello task as the out file from the hello task. And then we're gonna define the hello task itself. Like I said, the task comes, the basic task has an input, a command, and an output, taking an input of file type, of type file called my name. Um, it's gonna use this name in the command. So if you wanna, so this is a parameter and not necessarily what the file is. So it's just a variable. And I'll, sh I'll go over how you would specify the value of this variable later. But basically, when you use it in a command or even in other, if I describe the parameter and use it elsewhere, I would have to, once after it's defined, like with its type and its name, to actually use it, you enclose it in this dollar sign and these brackets. And then I'm specifying that the output for this task is an out file called hello.txt which is where I've uh, saved all the output from my commands. And so I've defined the output here at the task level so that I could expose it at the workflow level. Um, and at the workflow level is what I would actually get um, from running this workflow. So to actually fill in what those input values are, uh, from the Whittle workflow, you use a JSON parameter file. So a JSON file, um, it, it's, it's really just a text file that's composed of key value pairs. And you're using it to fill in those parameters or variables uh, in the Whittle file when you actually run the workflow. So here for my hello JSON, I am passing in a file called name.txt and that name.txt will, will find my workflow uh, through this key right here. So the key is composed of first the workflow name, which was hello world, the task name, which is hello, and the parameter name, which is my name. So this is how basically this value, which is a text file, will find that parameter in the workflow. And these values can be of type path, string, integer, array, et cetera. It's whatever you define this parameter type in your workflow. And note, uh, if, you're, if you are passing in a, a file, it's best to give it um, an absolute path. So let's go ahead and go back to instruct. I think your environment should have expired by now. Um, but go ahead and just refresh the page or and it should bring you back to this page over here. And just go ahead and click start to start a new one. And that should take another minute, which I'll go over what we're gonna be doing next. So we're gonna actually run your first Whittle. We're gonna run the Hello World Whittle, and it's a single task workflow. Like I said, it's only gonna run the Hello task. Um, it's running two commands here, and it's gonna take in a file um, ca called name.txt, but the parameter variable of that file is called my name. And it's gonna output 
to a file called hello.txt, and we're going to expose that output for Cromwell to, to set aside for us. We're going to run this workflow using the docsource CLI, um, using this docsource CLI command here, which will launch the local entry or something that's available on our local machine. Um, it's going to run the hello world whittle and then use the, the JSON hello.json. So go ahead and press start. Okay, so we're back in the instruct environment. You can go ahead and see under the Whittle trainings, under exercise one, you go ahead and open up the Whittle task. And you can go ahead and run these, this workflow uh, right here. First, you want to move into the directory where the Whittle file is located, and then you want to run the workflow. For in the instructions to run Cromwell through Cromwell here, but um, this is just for a reference. We're actually just going to be using the docs or CLI today. Go ahead and let me go ahead and do this with you. Um, and then if I change into the directory, I'm going to go ahead and run this workflow. So this is calling Cromwell under the hood. And Cromwell can be a little verbose in the execution. But you can see here the workflow was successfully run. And our outputs, hello world, hello file. And it jumped out. The outputs of the hello world, hello file are available in this temp directory that Cromwell uh, made for us. You go ahead and cat the contents of that directory. Say, hello world, my name is Potato. Um, so normally, Cromwell or Whittle and other workflows are running in, in uh, a special environment that will actually move these files and generate a GUI output. You'll learn more about those later. Um, but when you're running it in local machine or directly on the command line, this you will get the actual programmatic output that we see here. So what I just used was the docstore CLI. So the docstore CLI is a ha handy command line resource that docstore um, provides to help users develop content locally. So basically, it provides additional tooling to sit in, on top of, say, Cromwell or CWL tool um, that provides some nice handy features um, in addition to what these two engines uh, provide natively. So you can run descriptors locally, or you can run descriptors directly from DocStore using the DocStore CLI. It'll actually pull the descriptors that are stored on DocStore uh, and bring them to your local machine. You can use the DocStore CLI to actually to also create a JSON parameter template based on a descriptor. So it'll take a full descriptor and then give you a blank uh, template based on the contents of that descriptor so that you can fill in the values. Um, the DocStore CLI also does this a uh, very handy thing um, uh, with built-in plugins. Uh, they're basically file provisioning plugins that enable the DocStore CLI to fetch remote input data. So say your data is stored at an HTTP path, so it's somewhere on the internet. It could be on an S3 bucket, 
or a Google storage bucket, the Docsor CLI will actually go grab those um, data files and provision them to your local machine so that you can run them um, uh, directly on your machine as well. So uh, let's go over some more complicated details of what's in a task. So not every task is as simple as hello world. Sometimes you'll need more. Like maybe you need some actual software that's not on your machine. Because like I said, a task defines all the information necessary to perform an action. And part of that is the actual software or runtime environment that you need. So in the runtime block, you can define the context or environment that you need to run your task. This includes things like Docker containers or compute resource com requirements. Um, that could be things like CPU, disk, memory, et cetera. And if you're, using, if you're actually running your Whittle script on, say, um, a platform that you can launch, from, you can launch the script is, uh, from DocStore to, uh, these actual runtime requirements will be used to provision instances, uh, cloud instances at the task level and configure those instances with how much disk, CPU, memory, et cetera. One important thing to emphasize is that your descriptor um, is a parameterized, um, is a parameterized, it is important to parameterize your descriptor because you, you would like to be able to reuse and repurpose the workflows that you write. It allows for flexibility, it allows for modularity if you define variables as placeholders. And then you can use those, those defined parameters into subsequent parts of your task, such as in your command block, in your output block, or in your runtime block. So pretty much everything can be parameterized, but is this always a best practice? Sometimes you might actually want to hard code parameters or hard code values into your descriptor rather than keeping them as like a variable to fill in from the JSON later. That might be a case. Um, one, one example case is you might actually want to give it just um, the Docker image the actual name of the Docker image um, in order to make sure that that Docker image will be used um, and it would be required to use that specific Docker image to run your workflow. This can make it more secure and make your workflow more precisely reproducible and say, in the case, say that this is the workflow you're attaching or you used to um, generate some data for your publication. Um, so, may, so maybe you would want to hard code um, some specific parameters in that case. Otherwise, um, it's a great idea to parameterize var variables. So once again, you could reuse or repurpose things in your workflow. And once again, when you define your parameters, they're usually typed. But to actually use them, you have to enclose them in this bracket dollar sign syntax here. Non-input declarations um, are also part of a task, and they can help you in parameterizing your workflow. You can basically think of these as uh, intermediate values rather than inputs that you define in your descriptor, um, and they're helpful in executing your task. For example, you can define things like strings, uh, you can define integers, you can define files um, that are inside your workflow, uh, inside the task of your workflow and not necessarily inside an input block, command block, or an output block, but you can use, um, to create these non-input declarations, you can use things that are in, coming from your input block, and then you can subsequently use these uh, custom variables in your command and output blocks or your runtime blocks. So I'm going to go briefly go over the Whittle standard library. It's full of built-in functions and methods provided by the core Whittle language to help you write more complex workflows. Um, they're just some functions, some things that you, you could use to create those 
on input declarations. One example of that is before in the hello world task, what I had done was to, in, when I ran these commands, instead of having them go to standard out, I had redirected them and appended them to a file that I defined as hello text. So one thing in um, inside our Whittle or part of the Whittle standard library is you can use the standard out function um, to instead capture all the output from our from running our command or running our task um, and also save that into the out file rather than a specific file that we name. This can make the workflow more reusable because maybe you don't want to name something a certain text, you just really just want to capture the standard out. There's a bunch more more functions and useful things in the Whittle standard library that will include that as a link for you to check out later. Oops. So we're, for a primer for exercise two, we're gonna actually have a chance to parameterize a simple workflow. This workflow, it's a little more than just hello world. You're actually gonna generate some statistics about an alignment file. You're gonna use software SAM tool, specifically the flagstack command. Um, this software takes an input of a SAM file and generates as output some alignment statistics of that SAM file. So we're gonna provide you a skeleton that's already partially complete. Um, there's gonna be multiple ways to solve this assignment, um, but this is really a chance for you to apply the things we just talked about into a real bioinformatics workflow. So you're gonna go ahead and open up in instruct and do exercise two. Your task is gonna to be to set the runtime to use the SAM tools Docker container. Um, and then you're going to also parameterize the SAM tools command so that it uses the input SAM um, in the command task. And you can, if you would like, you could try and parameterize it even further. Um, but be sure to update the metrics JSON if you add any additional inputs um, or define, uh, yeah, basically just the, if you add any additional inputs, which you have to update the metrics.json. And just one thing before we get started, if you set a runtime of the Docker container, if you are hard coding it, you might want to add quotes to it. Uh, you have to add quotes for a hard coded um, Docker container. Go ahead and give you a couple minutes to do that task. And just like before, everything you need to do this exercise is in the exercise two directory. The solutions are provided. There are multiple solutions to this possible correct solutions to this problem but try not to look at them until we go over it later. And also the commands to run it are going to be on top right here. So one question is, does spacing matter? Uh, Whittle is not like Python in the sense that tabs and spacing matters too much.
go ahead when you've completed the task, um, just go ahead and click the yes check mark. Start with the most simple solution that you think will work and then maybe try and customize it later. If you need some additional help, or the Whittle instructions are also provided in one of the tabs of Instruct. Um, in these instructions, we go a bit more back into the background. couple more minutes, um, but we are about to take a break soon. So if you'd like to ask for some more help during that break, um, you can continue then as well.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and show the solutions. Um, we are taking a break soon, so if you are almost at a point of getting your workflow working, um, we can help you out during the break. So let's go over one of the potential solutions. Like I said, there are multiple solutions possible for this example. Um, this is this is the assignment right here. Um, notice I've had many sounds rather than uh, NA12878, a little typo there. Um, but for this simple solution, um, basically I'm using a hard-coded Docker Docker file. Uh, this actually should have been in quotes. Um, it should be correct in the actual instruct environment. This would have actually needed some quotes to run. Um, and I parameterized the SAM tools Blackstack command uh, so that it includes, so that it calls the parameter input SAM that we're feeding into this workflow. Um, it's still outputting to mini, the mini dot SAM dot metrics file and it's exposing that file as an output to the task and the overall workflow is exposing the output of the task as the output for the workflow. Okay. But we can parameterize this workflow even more. So this is another potential solution. In it, I'm creating a, a, a variable to called stats and I'm using a function from the Whittle standard library called base name. What the base name function does is it basically takes a file um, and it grabs, uh, it turns that file into a string. Uh, you can also do some more stuff to this function like remove certain characters or remove the extension, but I'm gonna keep the file as it is. I'm just gonna turn it into a string and append to that string dot metric so that this workflow can be reused uh, no matter what output I'm giving it. So I don't have to out, uh, hard code the name of that output. Um, and then using that stats variable that I've defined, and in here I am using a parameterized value called Docker image that I've also defined as an input variable. So what that basically means in my, what that basically means is that in my JSON file, I actually have to define what Docker image, what value this Docker image should be, and I would go ahead and input the SAM tools container there. But like I said, in some cases, you may want to hard code um, what container you can, you're, are going to use in terms of like wanting to make sure this workflow is more secure so you know exactly what container is going into your execution environment. Um, or if you want your workflow to be precisely reproducible. Well, let's go ahead and take a couple minutes break. And during this break, you can go ahead and try um, and getting your workflow running and what state it is in. And ask any further questions that you may have. Take five minutes. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back into it. So we just use, um, welcome back. We've just gone over our first kind of real world example, um, but in even more real world, real world cases or workflows you'll see in the wild, they're typically, as workflows are, multitask pipelines that build upon individual steps. Most commonly the output of one task serves as inputs or like dependencies of other tasks. And each task, each task in, in these workflows can have their own specific requirements. Um, and so uh, one, one strength of descriptors is that you can isolate these tasks in their own separate runtime environments. So like we went over why, why you might need separate containers because they, you might have different dependencies for different software. You might, you might break things up into separate tasks because those tasks require different things. Um, so 
in each of your tasks. You can specify a different Docker image to use, and you can specify specific compute requirements that are required for that task. So let's go over an example of what a multitask workflow looks like. We've already gone through the Hello World example, but we're gonna bring in this Goodbye World workflow. As you can see, they're pretty similar. They're um, the exact same amount of lines, but in the goodbye world example, um, we're calling a task called goodbye. We're giving it a file called by file, uh, a file called by file, and um, uh, we're getting from it a file called by file, which is the output of that goodbye task. Um, so the task is the goodbye task. It's going to take an input file called a greeting. I'm going to call a command that basically prints that greeting to standard out. And then afterwards, I'm going to echo, see you later. I'm going to capture all that uh, from standard out into a parameter called out file. So basically what I'm saying is I, I want to save what's coming from standard out from this task into a parameter called outbell. Notice that this, uh, uh, I misspoke earlier in saying this, the file was called this. This is actually just a parameter. It's an identifier for Cromwell. Uh, the file will actually be called standard out. But this identifier here is used at the workflow level to say the goodbye task, the parameter called outbell is what we want as the file parameter at the workflow level, the Cromwell will actually grab this identifier by file and, and save whatever this value is into a temporary directory. Um, so for an example multitask workflow, we're gonna combine the hello world and goodbye world tasks. Uh, we're gonna define at a workflow level, like I said, the workflow block is an outline for the for your, or you can think of it as an outline for your overall workflow. Um, so I'm saying to it, to call the hello task, call the goodbye task, and use the twist. Um, I am saying as the input to my goodbye task, I want the output of my hello task. Um, so basically, um, whatever hello outputs will be the, uh, input to goodbye, and the output of my overall workflow um, is, is given the identifier, hello goodbye, and is it's the output of the goodbye task. And basically what just happened here is I've added uh, the, the hello and the goodbye tasks to my multitask workflow so that uh, these calls can find it. Um, and basically, it will just execute uh, these tasks on how I've defined them up here in my workflow level. And if you look, if, if you notice that these, these tasks are exactly the same uh, as they were uh, in their separate files, the only thing that has changed is the workflow block, actually. And so the workflow block now explains how these tasks go together, but the actual task definitions are the same from the individual files. Uh, what did change is the goodbye hello is, is the JSON file. So now that I am using the output of goodbye, uh, the input of of goodbye is coming from the output of hello. I actually only need to have one parameter in my JSON file and not necessarily a separate parameter for each of the tasks. So another way to create a multitask workflow is to use import statements. So basically an import statement is how you want to import code from another, another Whittle um, and, and bring it into your, into your main Whittle. So this is useful in keeping large multitask workflows organized. Um, it's a little easy to just put two tasks together, but some workflows can definitely uh, be much longer than that. Um, so one way to, to, to keep that organized is to use 
import statements. And it's, import statements are also helpful if you want to reuse tasks uh, defined by others and build more modular workflows. So some concepts that um, are, are useful if you're using imports, these are just some high level concepts to note, is just the concept of a primary descriptor. You can think of this as the main descriptor file. Um, it anchors all the relevant imports that you're bringing into it. Um, that includes, this, so those imports or the external files that you're bringing into your, to your primary descriptor are called the sub workflows or sub whittles. Um, and namespaces, the concept of namespaces, are basically what are used to prevent any name collisions in when you bring in multiple different files together. It basically organizes tax, tasks and workflows into groups that are under separate namespaces so that you can always identify what variable belongs where. Um, aliases are, are custom name given to these namespaces. So aliases are optional. Um, they might be helpful in creating a name that is uh, more self-explanatory. Um, but if you don't give an alias, it default, uh, the namespace will default to the name of the file you're importing, but without the Whittle extension. So here's just a quick diagram showing what this is. So basically at the top of your Whittle file, you're gonna say import uh, the resource, which is a path or um, and I, uh, a way to get to that workflow, it's usually a path or an HTTP path, um, and the local path, uh, and it, you can give it an alias. And in the workflow block of your primary descriptor is once again where you're defining what tasks to call. Uh, first, I'm calling task A, or I'm calling task A, and task A is within my primary descriptor. But here I'm calling another task. And this task is actually coming from my import and I'm identifying it from that alias and I'm grabbing specifically a task from that alias called task one and providing any inputs that I may have defined to that imported task. For your JSON mapping, um, specifically to, to give something or to define inputs to this imported task, um, uh, the, base, the structure goes like this. It's still workflow name, task name, parameter name, and then the value uh, of that, the value you want to pass to that parameter. But one thing to note here, that the workflow name is the primary descriptor, the name of the workflow in the primary descriptor. You're not putting the alias name, because like I said before, your primary descriptor is now that your main descriptor file, it's what anchors um, all the relevant imports. So basically that's like localizing uh, whatever you imported uh, into your main descriptor file. So I'm gonna give an example. So for hello goodbye, I'm gonna give this example of how this works. First, you're gonna have an import statement to bring in the sub workflows. Um, if you don't give it an alias, it'll default to the name minus Whittle. Uh, otherwise, uh, the name's gonna, otherwise you can give it an alias. Here I'm giving goodbye world the alias goodbye. I'm gonna call the, the, the task hello world, um, uh, the hello task from hello world. The identifier is the namespace, which defaulted to the file name without the Whittle extension. And then I'm calling uh, the, the goodbye task from goodbye world, but I'm identifying it with the alias that I had given. Uh, the input is still the same as how I specified it when, without using imports. Um, and then the output is still also the same. And, that it, and so this is how it would look like without imports, with imports. So one thing to note is, do we have to change our JSON now that we've uh, now that we've changed this same workflow to instead of having the tasks in 
one file to use the import. Based on what I said before, since now everything is localized to the primary descriptor, actually, you, the, the same JSON file that ran this workflow, it can be used to also run this workflow. And this is just um, showing how this, how this comparison looks like if we don't use any comments. Um, you can see it's much more concise. Uh, and this can be helpful when you're running a lot of tasks to, to, to spread out your workflow over multiple files. Uh, one caveat is not all launch with platforms uh, support imports or they have some specific caveats um, to support imports. So looks like we have a bit of time to try out exercise three. Uh, um, we may not get, have enough time to complete it, but we'll at least get you started and maybe after the workshop, you can keep trying it out. Um, so basically for exercise three, you're gonna have a chance to create a multitask workflow yourself. So you're already familiar with the metrics whittle that we created earlier and it evaluated an alignment file. We specifically aligned evaluated a SAM file, but you could also use a BAM file, and it reported statistics about that alignment. So this aligner whittle is actually going to create that alignment file that it's going to generate some statistics about. So we're going to write a workflow that does both of these tasks. It's first going to align, and then it's going to generate statistics about that alignment. You'll have the option to write it without imports or with imports. So here is just to show you, um, so don't worry about having to write these workflows. They're already provided for you in the instruct environment. Your task is actually just going to be going to put them together um, and try and get that working. So I'm just going to go over this very briefly. This is the aligner whittle. Um, it's calling the BWA align task, which uh, produces this, so this workflow will produce um, uh, an aligned SAM, and its inputs are going to be the things necessary to run that BWA command. It's going to be things like the raw sequence files, Docker image, the options for BWA, and any reference files that are necessary. You can do things also like uh, specifying the runtime, specifying the metadata. It may look a little more complicated, but it's really just the same uh, concepts that we've been going over through this training today. And you've already seen the metrics whittle and had a chance to actually play with it yourself. The same exact one um, as the solution from exercise two. You don't have to use the one from exercise two that you created. Um, all these files are provided in the exercise three directory. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to, to try this. And then um, we, for the interest of time, I'd have to move on. But uh, like I said, you'll have a chance to keep trying this. Your Instruct environment is still going to be available. And you can always ask questions in the Discord. So to show you in the exercise three directory, you'll have the hello examples. The, the, example, the hello world examples are all in this directory here if you would like to take a look at them. The parts, which is the aligner, the metrics whittle. Um, the solution is here. I would recommend not looking at that yet. Um, but, and then you also have the, the, the skeletons or scaffolds to help get you started. Like you have the option to do it without imports and the option to do it with imports. And there are some more information in the Whittle Instructions tab um, if you need some more context.
So the question is, do we get a complete path to the Whittle task files? I think you're talking about in the imports case. Yes, you can use a relative path from in, in when you're importing the task from where your primary descriptor is. So if it's in a separate directory, you would say it's in the parts directory and then the name of that file. Right, so in interest of time, I know you haven't had enough time to complete this task, um, but we are starting to run out of time for this workshop here. Uh, you will still have, uh, you will still have access to that instruct environment. You can go ahead and try uh, this a little later. Um, so just want to be able to close out the workshop, and talk more about things. These best practices and tips slide. Um, We'll be sending home some take home readings so you can read about more this more about this on how to use descriptor on how to use imports specifically, maybe some caveats. Um, we'll be sending this to you. One thing to I would like to emphasize is adding metadata and parameter metadata to your Whittle files to make them more readable and understandable to others and to also make sure that um, people can pre precisely reproduce your workflow or maybe contact you if they're having problems. Um, we'll add more information about that in the take home materials. And there's some more trainings and tutorial content uh, that we've provided for you. These were, will also be included in the take home resources that we're going to be sending out at the end of the conference. But that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let Dennis close this out for the day. Okay. Hi, is my screen showing uh, properly for everyone? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, okay, so everyone, you've learned a bit about Docker and you've learned a little bit about Whittle. Um, we'll end by sort of doing a few callbacks to DocStore itself. Um, now that you have an understanding of Docker and workflow languages, hopefully you have a better appreciation for what DocStore is trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do in regards to portability, interoperability, and reproducibility. The basic idea is that if you put your open source workflows on something like Bitbucket, GitHub, or GitLab, you will be able to store your descriptors and register them as tools and workflows on DocStore. This allows for a centralized catalog of bioinformatics resources. Um, and we're interoperable with a large number of analysis environments. Um, they're listed there on the right. Uh, but one other thing I wanted to note here is that we recently added um, support for GitHub apps, which allow you to very quickly edit your workflows on GitHub and get them synced to DocStore automatically without any additional work on your part. Um, looking a little bit more deeply at launching analysis, once you have a workflow um, registered on DocStore, there's a series of buttons on the right hand side of your workflow, which allow you to launch your workflows in a variety of partner platforms. Um, there's DNA Stack, DNA Nexus, Terra, the Cancer Genomics Cloud by Seven Bridges, there's Anvil and BD Catalyst. In practice, what you want to do rather than run workflows through the Docstore command line is to take advantage of one of these partners to run your workflow at scale without really having to worry about managing your own cluster or managing your own tooling yourself. And here's an example of what it would look like once you've clicked through to Anvil. Um, there's a link to the original workflow on DocStore itself, and you'll find that this particular workflow is part of the Anvil organization and their collection of Cumulus workflows. Um, and there's the contributor down there at the bottom. 
And well, what is uh, organization? Um, oh, okay. So I, this is going to be a little bit out of order, but for general practices, um, we have a series of tutorials on the DocStore site where you can basically find out how to include information such as authorship or contact information for your workflows. Um, we explain a bit about why it's good to use tags for your workflows instead of branches um, in the sense that when you're using releases and tags, they're less likely to change and it keeps your versioning consistent, i.e. more reproducible. We have a bit of information on test parameter files. The idea is that when you share your workflow with others, you often want to provide test parameters that use publicly available data that allow others to play around with your workflow reasonably quickly and maybe some other test parameter files that include larger real world examples um, of data. We have different features that allow people to find your workflow. So labels to um, basically make it easier for others to search for your workflow. Uh, we have a snapshot and DOI functionality that I'll show a little bit about in the next slide. And for those really advanced users, we have checker workflows that you can read about that allow uh, people to test the compatibility of your workflow with different workflow environments. So for DOIs, um, here's an example of what the interface looks like on DocStore for issuing a DOI. The idea is that you can first hit a snapshot button, which will freeze your workflow for eternity, allowing people to go back to it for um, in the future to reproduce your work. And the idea is that you can request a DOI that you can use in your publications to refer back to the workflow uh, that you used. For organizations, organizations are structured in a way that allows uh, different labs to organize and collect workflows, either from themselves or from other people. Um, here's an example and a screenshot of a COVID-19 collection um, that is produced and maintained by the Broad Institute. Um, you will find that there are organizations that will also highlight other people's workflows. For example, your lab may use a variety of workflows that are both written by yourself and written by others. And you can use this feature in order to basically share your work and show off uh, the set of workflows that you use. For getting help on DocStore, there's a handy button on the top right of the screen where you can basically click on a help button and be sent to our user forum where you can basically ask the members of our team to assist you with particular workflows or just with workflow technologies in general. To wrap up a lot of the information that we're linking out to and that you will be getting in your take home uh, materials is actually available on docs.docstore.org. You will find a large series of documentation and tutorials at that site to help guide you um, in your work. Um, so to finish off, I'd like to thank like the members of the DocStore ecosystem. Uh, the community has pulled together over 700 tools and workflows, and there's a partial listing of some of the contributors to content on DocStore. And on the right, um, various integration partners that we've had that and we're very thankful for being able to run workflows from the DocStore system. To wrap up completely, um, I'd like to thank Andrew and Louise who've done the majority of the work for this presentation. Um, and there's a listing of the other members of the team that also develop and support the DocStore site as a whole. And that about wraps it up.